You might be interested in knowing that I have had the privilege of being your interim pastor as of this Sunday for the past 1,590 days. You might also be interested in knowing that out of those 1,590 days, 226 of those have been Sundays. You might be interested in knowing that of those 226 Sundays, this is my 190th message that I've had the privilege of bringing to you. You might be interested in knowing that out of those 226 Sundays, 101 of them were done under the umbrella of COVID. You might be interested in knowing that out of those 101 Sundays of COVID, 48 of those services were online only and 53 were held in person, but with some sort of numerical restriction. You might also be interested in knowing that in the last 226 Sundays, among other things, we have worked through the Ten Commandments, the Book of Ephesians, the Sermon on the Mount, the parables of Jesus, the Book of Philippians, the Book of First John, and we have celebrated four Christmases, four Easter's, and have celebrated four Baptism Sundays together. You might also be interested in knowing that Oak Bank Baptist Church has been around in some form for 127 years might be interested in knowing that since the church's birth in 1894 and after some 65 years of help from McDermott Avenue Baptist Church, Oak Bank Baptist Church hired their very first senior pastor in 1960. You might also be interested in knowing that Pastor Adam, who is starting tomorrow, will be the 15th senior pastor of this church. So you might be sitting there wondering why the history lesson, Bruce? Well, I'm convinced that it's not just fun to look back, but it can be a very healthy thing to look back on our history. And it's healthy because while you and I tend to measure most things in seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and maybe for some of us even decades, I'm convinced that God measures time very differently than we do. We tend to measure time by asking, how old are you? We tend to measure time and life by saying, how long have you been working there? Or how long have you been married? We tend to measure time and life by by asking, how old are your kids? Or how long have you been retired? And again, we tend to measure life and time very differently than God does. One of my favorite authors, Leonard Sweet, talks about how strange he thinks it is that we seem to celebrate so many arbitrary and, as he would call them, mediocre things to the exclusion of other things that are possibly more meaningful. You know, we celebrate being a year older when maybe we should be celebrating becoming a year wiser. We celebrate anniversaries when maybe we should be celebrating when God helps a couple to overcome a challenge. We celebrate how long we've been with a certain company when maybe we should be celebrating the difference that we've made in that company and what we have accomplished. And I've seen this with a number of churches too. We tend to celebrate when a pastor has been at that church for 10 years when maybe what we should be celebrating is what God has done within the people of that church during the time that the pastor's been there. And we all tend to celebrate things like birthdays and anniversaries and things that land on a certain date on the calendar when maybe we should be celebrating real milestones like the date that you met Christ, you know, the day that your kids came to know the Lord, the date of your baptism, the date that he taught you a valuable lesson. But instead, we often choose to spend our time celebrating things that in the grand scheme of things, maybe aren't really that significant. And I wonder what God celebrates. Do you ever wonder that? And today, I want us to spend some time looking at the life and the words of Solomon. Because Solomon really has a lot to say about how God views time, and just maybe how we should be viewing time as well. So, first of all, who was Solomon, and why should we even care what he says about this issue? The life of Solomon is summarized in the books of 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Chronicles. And the name Solomon actually means peaceful and a friend of God. 
We know from scripture that Solomon was born in Jerusalem, that he was the second born child of David and his then wife Bathsheba. And that's a a whole different story that we're not going to get into today. But I will say that Solomon's life, as it's recorded in these Old Testament books, reflect that he served as kind of a peace offering between God and King David because of David's adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. Solomon was also incredibly wealthy and he was known worldwide as being a very wise monarch of the United Kingdom of Israel, according to the Old Testament. It's typically thought of that Solomon reigned from 970 BC to 930 BC And he was also the last ruler of the amalgamated Israel and Judah. In fact, his death led to the splitting of the Israelites into the kingdom of Israel in the north, the kingdom of Judah in the south. And after that split, his descendants ruled over Judah alone. In the Jewish thought, he is considered to be one of the 48 great Jewish prophets. But even in Islamic tradition and in the Quran, He's referred to as being a very wise Islamic prophet. He's also identified as being a brilliant architect and was responsible for the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. He began to build it in the fourth year of his reign, using all the wealth that he and his father had accumulated. But Solomon is probably best known for his wisdom. And it's interesting how often his wisdom is referenced in Scripture. Even Jesus talked about it in Matthew 12, verse 42. He says, The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. And you might be asking, well, where did Solomon get all this wisdom from? Well, as the story is told in the book of 1 Kings, Solomon had made a sacrifice to God, and God later appeared to him in a dream, asking what he wanted from him. And Solomon asked God for wisdom in order to better rule and to guide his people. Well, apparently God answered Solomon's prayer, promising him that great wisdom that he asked for. In fact, we're told that God was pleased with Solomon's request because he asked for something that wasn't self-serving, like a long life or the death of his enemies. But God also gave him a, a massive amount of wealth. In fact, according to the Old Testament, the Israelite monarchy gained its highest position of power and wealth during Solomon's 40-year reign. We're even told that in a single year, according to 1 Kings 10, Solomon collected taxes or tributes amounting to 18,125 kilograms of gold. That is a lot of money. But Solomon is also described in scripture as someone who surrounded himself with all the luxuries and the grandeur of an Eastern monarch. Before you start thinking that this is a biblical success story, We also learn that Solomon wasted much of his time and energy and money on acquiring material things. And he lived his life constantly striving after more stuff. And he would eventually lose focus on what was most important. And to top that all off, he even allowed false gods to move in to his own backyard. As one author put it, Solomon chased many rainbows and left with him the sad words, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And all of that really brings us to the doorstep of the book of Ecclesiastes, an Old Testament book of the Bible that most scholars believe Solomon wrote towards the end of his life, towards the end of his very up and down relationship with God. And in this profoundly reflective book, Solomon gives us a window into the human condition. He opens up his soul. He talks about his own search for meaning. But he also gives us a window into our time here on earth and how God views that time. And it's interesting that as you read this book that at times feels like you're eavesdropping on a personal journal. It's interesting that Solomon admits that the wealthier he got, the more stuff he acquired, 
the further and further he got from his creator. And he's very transparent in the book. In fact, he talks about how he had it all. Whatever his eyes saw and wanted, he took it. And he didn't deny himself any physical pleasure, he says. But then we're told that one day he woke up and he was empty. Solomon retrospectively looked at all that he had and all that his life had accomplished, and he pondered how he had tried to find meaning in stuff. And he concluded that the various seasons of his life had, for the most part, been wasted as he had spent so much time running after meaningless things. And at the end of the day, he learned that striving for happiness is a poor goal that will lead to nothing but feelings of emptiness. And he talked about this in the first two chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes. He talks about his search for wisdom in chapter 1, verse 18, and concluded that, as he puts it, much study is a weariness to the flesh. He talks about his search for pleasure in chapter 2, verse 1, and concludes that this is vanity. He talks about his search for a substance to alter the mind in chapter 2, verse 3. And he likely became an alcoholic in the process. And he concluded that this too is just folly or foolishness. He talks about his search for meaning through materialism in chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. And he says, I made great works. I built great structures. I planted. I had it all. And he ends up concluding that it is all just useless stuff that will eventually end up in a landfill someday. He talks about his search for meaning through status and authority, through wanting to be a great leader, a leader to his people as well as to the world in chapter 2, verse 7. And he fought for and won more power and influence, and he was a commander and a master. And at the end of the day, he concluded that there was no love there. They only follow out of fear. He talks about his search for security in chapter 2, verse 8, for a life free of worry and fear and anxiety. And he concluded that the more I have, the more I have to be worried about. And if I counted correctly, Solomon says, I, me, mine, and myself, 59 times in chapter 2. And Solomon transparently admits that a self-serving life is an empty life. Vanity of vanities, he says, all is vanity. And the point that Solomon is really trying to make here is that if we spend our lives trying to find meaning and trying to figure out our purpose, it's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that he, God, has a purpose for us. And you can choose to spend your life trying to figure out why you are on this earth, or you can simply let God show you his purpose. And Solomon writes about that in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, and this is what he says. Verse 1, there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear down and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Part of what Solomon is attempting to communicate in these verses is that God has ordained a season for everything in our lives where you and I tend to think about life in terms of the hour a week we spend at church, the eight hours a day we spend at work, the 45 years we've lived on this earth, the 19 years that you've been married, the eight months that you've been unemployed, the two months that you've been in the hospital, the 1,590 days that I've been your interim pastor. Maybe, just maybe we need to see all of those things in our lives as godly, ordained seasons. 
Solomon goes on to, to further make that point in verse 9 to 14 of chapter 3, where this is what he says. He says, what do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful. Okay, and then he throws in a qualifier here. He says, in its time. He has also said eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Verse 13, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. And you know something, my friends, if we're honest with each other, we don't often see these seasons that God gives us as a gift, do we? But entering into a new season gives us the opportunity to re-acknowledge that God is the one in control. Entering into a new season means accepting that things are about to change. Entering into a new season means that we're understanding that we might need to change. But I also believe that entering into a new season can also birth new champions. You know, there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven. You know, we have this beautiful tree in our front yard. And one of the reasons I wanted to shoot my message here is so that you can see it. And I know that some of you have seen pictures of it before, but if you haven't, I keep them all in a folder on Facebook that I call Seasons of Our Tree. And every new season, I take a picture of the tree. And in it, we have pictures of this tree from winter, spring, summer, and fall. And as the seasons change, so does this beautiful tree. You know, the colors change, the leaves fall off, the leaves grow back. The leaves turn green, the leaves turn yellow, the leaves turn orange. And then the leaves are gone again, and it all starts over. And you know what? We and our lives are no different. Our lives are filled with all kinds of different seasons. And although we, in our finite way of thinking, measure our lives in hours and days and weeks and months and years, God faithfully leads each of us in and out of all of the different seasons that we experience. Some seasons are long, some are short. Some seasons are filled with joy and hope while others are filled with pain and maybe some disillusionment. But maybe, just maybe we need to see all of those seasons in our lives as being godly ordained seasons. But you know, it's not just our lives that have seasons, churches go through seasons as well. And tomorrow, you, OBC, start a brand new season. And this is what I'm certain of. When I started as your interim pastor 1,590 days ago, we also started a process of searching for a new lead pastor. And when I started here 1,590 days ago, we committed ourselves to prayer, asking God to guide our steps to guide our search process and to be actively preparing the individual and us for the call that you would put on his life. And I can stand here today and tell you that God has been faithful in that prayer. He has faithfully done that. Now, the past 1,590 days have been a wonderful season for Monica and I. And this message will likely be our last message for some time. But we celebrate with you what God is doing in this season of OBC's life. And we will continue to pray that God will cause you to grow and move forward and to take those next steps into the preferred future that he has for this wonderful church. Thank you so much for how you have embraced Monica and I and we do look forward to watching the beautiful season unfold in front of you, uh, such a wonderful uh, congregation. Lord bless.